Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I didn't expect such a large audience, uh, although I see some people from my team. So if you have any questions, uh, those from my team expect, I will deflect them your way. Uh, I would like to start by saying a few words about myself. My name is Jaromir Hergilek. I'm uh, one of the managers in content services. Uh, I've been with Red Hat since 2010. And I started as a technical writer. So a lot of what I'll be, I'll be talking about is still dear to me. And I had a chance to experience part of it myself, although I still feel that I'm luckier as a manager because I'm learning from my talented team who are much smarter than me. Uh, I don't have a slide for Kartik, but please quickly speak about yourself. Kartik, at Red Hat since April 2016, uh, in, yeah, in the same team, and this is the best job of my life. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So I wanted to start by just qualifying a few things about documentation. If you were listening to Mark Mufeld, you very likely are tired of that, but I just want to quick, quickly clarify a few things because documentation is a broad term. When people say documentation, you imagine absolutely anything that is written, documented, with uh, video, audio content, anything. And product the documentation teams usually focus on a tiny little piece of it. Uh, I copied this from our internal mojo. Uh, it's our mission. And our mission is to write documentation that helps customers with what they want to accomplish. Uh, if you work with Linux, there is no shortage of documentation. There's absolutely no shortage of documentation. There's so much information everywhere else, and you are very likely able to find information about what you were trying to do. The difficult part is finding information that you need to accomplish what you want to do with it, or figuring it out yourself. So what we do is we write documentation that is targeted at customers, people who pay for our products, people who use our products in production to achieve something amazing on their own. Uh, we are paid to learn our products. Uh, I don't believe that you can write documentation that is targeted to customer without having a clue of what you're writing about. Uh, we communicate with other teams because we are not in direct contact with our customers, so we use our other teams to figure out what our customers are doing with our products so that we can then figure out what to write about. Uh, I don't have it on the slide, but when I have a new hire, I usually describe our role and hope that I won't scare them as we suffer so that nobody else ever has to again. So we figure out what is needed and try to compile the documentation in a way that makes sense and hopefully is easy to read. Uh, we Just a quick poll. How many of you are tech writers at the moment? Nice. Uh, what do we don't do? We are not translators, we are not editors, and we unfortunately don't write manual pages, but we have a good reason. I think that developers are much better at that. Uh, that's our excuse. Uh, we are also, our team is not just technical writers. We have a whole lot of other roles. I will not spend too much time on this. One of them is, of course, Kartik, who is my boss. Always fun to present in front of my boss. Uh, I want to start. I want to show a few things how we evolved our documentation and I think that the important thing is to start not necessarily at the very beginning but give a little brief look at the history. So Red Hat and Press Linux, our biggest documentation I think still on our portal. We had 44 bo 46 books, 38 Git repositories, all written in Docbook XML, uh, which a lot of people hate. And uh, I will point at those 46 books. So if you look at our, our documentation, this is what you traditionally expect. If you look at our uh, the list of the books, I don't think that you will notice anything wrong because there's the usual installation guide, system administrator's guide, networking guide, security guide, and all of that. In reality, when you are doing absolutely anything with pretty much any piece of software, you need to read two or more of these books to find all the information that help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. So we're doing we were doing terribly there. Uh, if we zoom in and look at the one guy, this is, if I'm criticizing my content, I am responsible for this, this is my fault. But we tried to focus on customers and we thought about things like topic-based authoring and use cases and stuff like that, but we failed because we still focused just on individual components. So it's, if you just want to learn about System D, great. There is a huge chapter about that, and you learn everything how to use System D in isolation. Chances are you don't need to learn the whole System D. Chances are you just need two commands that you need to run to enable and uh, to start and enable the service, and forget about the rest. So we're wasting your time by making you navigate our documentation so that you can figure out all you needed in the first place was those two commands. 
also uh, the books were big, the books are big, and finding that information is not as trivial as it should be. Uh, I summed it up here, uh, we have artificial isolated information. In reality, if you want to set up absolutely anything, my favorite example is a web server, you need installation guide, you need system administration guide to learn about how to install that software in your, how to subscribe to the system, install it in, the, in your system, how to start it, you need networking guide, you need a security guide, and our documentation is not helping. You need to figure out what you need. Uh, we also have way too much content, and when you look at statistics, uh, not all of it is read as much as it should be. Uh, so we're possibly wasting a lot of time. It's also very difficult to keep up to date. I will not go into the book XML, because there may be people in the room who actually like it. Uh, I'm one of them, for the record. Uh, but more importantly, no matter what I think, uh, this is what our customers think. And we kept hearing about it over and over again. So at some point, uh, we realized, well, this is what it feels like. This is a favorite example. So imagine you are a pilot of an airplane, and all of a sudden something happens, and your airplane goes nose down. And you have a few seconds to react. And somebody tells you, oh, great. For this component, here's one book. For this component, here's one book. The information is there. Figure it out. By the time you are out of the shock, you're dead. Uh, what you need is somebody to tell you exactly. You are in this situation. Great. Press this button, put this, pull this, and this is it. And you need to be able to do it quickly. That's what we try to do with our documentation. And we're not delivering. Uh, this is a little look, uh, look, look back even before, and you will see that we kept repeating the same thing. We always felt like this, we're evolving, we're adapting, we're doing something new, but what ended up happening is that we kept reshuffling the information that we begin with and never questioned the content. So this is the evolution of one book, how it evolved over time, but if you trace anything in the documentation, usually it is there because it was relevant in round three or even before that. And we always had it there and it's technically accurate. So let's keep <coughs> updating it for every single release and spend so much time keeping it up to date. This is how we got there. So for round eight, we realized that, okay, mm -hmm, and for other products as well. I will be talking about round eight because that's our team majority of people in this room are still but not in this room, the majority of people from my team on, in this room are working on RHEL. Uh, that's what I feel comfortable talking about, and if I criticize something, I can point at things that I wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. So for RHEL 8, we did it slightly differently, and we realized we need to make some changes, not only uh, in the level of content and how we approach the content, but also how we develop that content to enable us to do the dog book, the structure of books, all of that was holding us back. So, one rule that we established is all of our documentation, no, no exceptions, are based on user stories. If it is in RHEL 8, it means because we found a user story, somebody is using it, somebody is doing this. I'll talk about what user story is in a second. We put everything in one git for one product in one repository so that we don't have that artificial separation of content and duplication of content across several different books. And we adopted something called modular documentation, which means that we write small pieces, I'll talk about it a little bit in detail, but we write small chunks of information that are used all over, the, that can be used all over the place. So if you're reading documentation on how to establish, how to work with, uh, how to uh, set up a web server, and part of that is starting the service and enabling it, we put the information right there. There is a module that tells you that. If it involves setting up firewall, again, you get the information in one documentation that guides you from point A to finished running web server that you can trust because we document a supported way. And we started writing in ASCII-Doc, which is much more flexible than DocBook and easier to train people with. So if you look at RHEL 8 title, this is a typical title. It is based on the user story. It had, knows who its target audience is, and a side effect of this is most of it is relevant to you. If you if you find this title for the reason that you this title for the purpose that this title is trying to fulfill, most of the information should be useful for you, should guide you, and 
as, a, as an effect, also most of our titles are <coughs> focused. Some of them have less than pages, 20 pages. I took, a, you want to say anything? Yes, uh, I just wanted to add that we have also begun this mm -hmm. service called direct documentation feedback, where when you go to our portal, you are going through some documentation and if you have a question or a suggestion, you can just right click, select a chunk of text and... Uh, I have a slide about Yes, sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> can tell that we are unprepared. Uh, module documentation. I want to talk a little bit about it, and I hope that Mark didn't talk about that, because modular documentation is something that helped us pull it off. Uh, it allows writers to focus on small bits of small bits of information. A module is something that has a clear focus and is. It's a logical chunk of information and notes its normal purpose. There are three types of modules that we have. Procedure, assembly, uh, procedure, reference, and concept. Modules are grouped together in assemblies to complete a certain user story, to document a certain user story. Uh, user story, I have a long text here, but in a sense, this is all you need. I stole this from our content strategist. User story tells us who you are, what you are trying to do and why. And for us that is very important because unless we know who you are and what you are ultimately trying to accomplish, it's very difficult to find what to write about. We guess a lot. The RHEL 7 documentation, we just try to document everything you can possibly do with the tool and hope that what you are trying to do with it is there. So user stories, everything that is in RHEL 8 documentation now means that we identified, found to use the story for that and are confident that we are doing it right. Uh, and there are those three types of, of modules that I don't want to go into detail of, but there's a concept module, general information about all the background information that you, you need to know to understand what you're reading about. Uh, we don't try to teach you. This is another big thing about, about uh, our old, old ways. When you look at all of our guides for all seven and pretty much everything that Red Hat offers, you will notice that most of the books have a guide in their name. Because our ultimate goal was to take your hand and take you with us on a journey and guide you safely to what you wanted to accomplish. And we failed at that miserably because most when you start reading them, you s realize that we are trying to teach you. And we assume that you have all the time in the world to care about all of these components and study them and then figure out how to make them work together. In reality, that's not the case. I, I myself am terrible at reading documentation when I need to set up something. The last time I needed to migrate data from my phone, I found the first article that had those three steps. I didn't care about anything else. Uh, so conceptual module is important, but when we present it, we always think, what is the minimum that you actually need? We don't want to teach you about everything that you can possibly know about this, no. We want it to be relevant to what you're about to read. Equip you with enough background, but not more. Not more. Uh, this is an untranslated slide. I'm sorry, I was doing it at 5 o'clock in the morning. and uh, stole it from a different presentation, but illustration of what a conceptual module can look like. We have procedural modules, uh, which uh, are pretty much the majority of what we have. Uh, those are supposed to guide you through some action. They require you to do something. Or they hope that they, you do something. Uh, they have prerequisites as an explicit thing, which is a good thing, because whenever I read documentation that randomly pulls out things that I should have set up and I did not, because nobody told me, and now I need to find how to do that thing so that I can go back, I hate it. We try to be upfront about it if you need some equipment, if you need to pre-configure something, we should tell you before you even start the procedure. Uh, and then we are very careful about using steps so that you can clearly see this is step one, this is step two, I can see that this will take seven steps and I can assume whether it will take an hour or two days. Again, an example of a procedural module. And reference modules are those for reference data is important, reference information is very important as well. So all those tables, all those other options that you might need. Things like that we put in reference modules. They are support to complement complement the documentation that we have in other modules. And again, 
to what you need. This is an example of a reference module. And when put together, we end, end up with focused, clear titles. And we can reuse many of these modules in different contexts. Well, we do all of that in GitHub, uh, in uh, ASCII-Doc. It is one caveat. It sounds easy when you think about small documentation, but our documentation is massive. The last time I checked, we had 3,000 modules, something like that. So a lot of information. Uh, it's we're getting in problems that that wouldn't be unsolvable without a few tools that we use. So we use Git, GitLab, and continuous integration. Uh, I will skip this slide because I don't have time. So Git, you probably know it. If not, if not, what it allows us for, for it allows us for, on RHEL we have over 30 writers working on multiple things at the same time. The last time I checked, we were working on 60 different things at one time. It would be mess. It wouldn't be, we wouldn't ever be able to publish if we had to do all of that in just a plain file system. So we use Git and we use branches so that everybody can work on their happy way and Git hopefully manages to resolve everything and put it together whenever we need to, pull, to publish something. It allows us to develop non -linear, in a non-linear <coughs> fashion. Uh, we use GitHub, GitLab so that we can easily contribute. Uh, it has a nice feature that is called merge requests, which we use to keep track of all of our work. So the number that I mentioned, how many things we are working on, I can look at merge requests and I see that we have this many merge requests open and most of them are in work in progress. So I know that these are the things that people are actually working on. It also provides a great web user interface so that it can supplement authoring software for people who are not as familiar with Git. And this is the one that I want to pause on, continuous integration, because people associate this with development but we successfully use it for documentation. There are many things you can do with continuous integration, but for us one important thing is, I mentioned many times, that our modules are used in multiple contexts. What if I usually, when I work on a module, I get to it from one particular context. I look at documentation and see, okay, this guide, this information is missing. This module is the right place to put it in, so I need to update it. How do I know that I didn't break anything else? So we have continuous integration set up in a way that whenever somebody pushes changes to, um, to a, their topic branch that has a merge request associated with it, continuous integration automatically picks it up, validates it, and builds preview for all titles that use this module. And it gives you links so that you can always see, oh, oops, I wanted to just update installation information, but I updated five different books as well. And it gives you a chance to look and see if that information still works, if you didn't break anything. Sometimes you break things. Sometimes you use something, refer to something that is not available in that assembly, and the build breaks. So again, you immediately have a chance to see that and react before it ever gets into our main, main branch. Uh, additional feature is that these previews are available to absolutely anybody. So we very often refer our subject matter experts, people who review our documentation, people who care about our documentation, to these. So they can proactively always see, okay, so this is the latest that you've done. Did you implement my changes, my suggestions yet? No. And they can engage in conversation in the comment section or comment on our code and allow us to collaborate more smoothly. And because they very often use Git themselves, they sometimes probably push their changes to us directly. So, I rushed through this because normally I do this in an hour. Uh, hopefully I didn't rush too fast, so I want to thank you for your patience and bearing with me, but instead of having this useless slide, as much as I like looking at my cat, uh, I want to leave with this slide, which is the direct documentation feedback, and if you can, if you don't remember anything that I say, remember that if you ever happen to read our documentation, we have this enabled, and you can give us feedback. And it's not pointless to give us feedback because we take it very seriously. Okay. All for me. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? How? Yeah, go ahead. So how do you, uh, you told that you are able to build the, the, the documentation, like the, the I think PDS or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, 
based on what changed? How is that working? Like, how, how, how do you take the dependencies? Yeah, what from the git commit? How do you, so, uh, how do you track down what, what's, what yeah. needs to be rebuilt? Yeah, so we asked our development to the team to implement this for us. Mm -hmm. they, they knew how to do that. So they basically look at what is different between the master, what, what are the changes that are unique to this branch. Mm -hmm. They look at which files changed. Mm -hmm. And then the script looks at what titles include this. Okay. So we have predictable directory okay. structure. We know where the titles are. Based on the changed files. Yes, exactly. Yep. How does the feedback look on your end? Like in what kind of tool shows mm -hmm. that? Does job? Um, what kind of context do you get? Yeah. yeah. So you usually select a piece of text and add a comment. It opens a bug for us. Mm -hmm. It quotes the line that you commented on and includes your comment. Uh, it also is clickable so that it leads us uh, back to your comment there, which is my, what I recommend everybody to do when this gets to your queue. You get this assigned, react on it, click that link, retrace it back, figure out what the comment is actually trying to say and take a note because it sometimes takes a little bit of investigation to get in your head what you meant by yeah. what you and, and this uses bug zilla. We okay. use bug zilla. We're trying to switch to Jira. I'm yeah. not sure where that's... We'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, is, is that, I mean, the very documentation feedback a custom solution of yourself or is it an existing tool that you just used? Can you repeat the question? Yes, uh, uh, the question was if uh, it's a custom solution, the direct documentation feedback, or if it's something that other people can use. Yeah. I do believe it's in-house, it's custom for our customer portal. And it's not deployed, unfortunately, on all products. It's still in pilot mode. But RHEL is important and has... Yeah. I, I got yeah. two questions. Um, what do the assemblies look like? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, how do you deal with um, reusing and discovering reusable content rather mm. than just like, oh, I'll rewrite this and it already exists. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I'll try to answer it quickly and get to you. Uh, so assembly, it's an ASCII doc file that has its includes and includes all of the modules that it needs. So on, on that level, it's relatively simple. It also has get some... Hash, hmm? by, by get URL or what? No, no, no. Uh, we, we're working in one Git repository, so it's just an include. Um, and with the relative path to, to the modules. Uh, there is additional markup for if you want to structure it, present it in any other way. Usually there's some introduction, possibly prerequisite specific for that, for that uh, assembly. Uh, to your other question, uh, this is a thing that we are trying to solve. Uh, our team is working on a technical solution for that. For now, we are careful about annotating our our, our modules, we have hierarchy that allows us to quickly find where it belongs. And so if it is about networking, we have a directory for that. So at least we can quickly find it. And we have very strict naming conventions. So usually it's, a, it's looking for keywords, quick grab or quick search. So far it works, but we are at the edge of where this is barely good enough. So we're desperately waiting for the tool. It will help us make sense of it. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that uh, your documentation is, is now user-centric focused. Mm -hmm. And maybe I didn't get that, but I, I think that you didn't say anything about how these user stories get created, so to say. Mm -hmm. so, so who is your user? Do you guys sit down mm -hmm. and think about what the user might want to do and mm -hmm. then follow this journey? Mm -hmm. Do you get direct feedback from users that didn't know how to accomplish this and that, and based on that, you fill in the gaps? I'm so tempted to let one of my writers answer, <laughs> because they've been through this, but they're trying, they're not looking at me, so probably they won't, don't want that. Uh, so. This is the private investigation part. We <laughs> want to make sure that we are not coming up with anything. If you think about it, you can manufacture absolutely anything if you put a little effort in that. So we partner, depending on where the prompt comes to us, sometimes it comes from, from engineering leads. This is a new feature. This, we implemented it based on this kind of request. So it's the first clue for us. But usually we try to understand ourselves and then ask people who face customers, support delivery teams, solution architects, consultants, people who are in the field, 
with customers and inquire with them, oh, is this work used? Is this correct? What would you expect? And we validate with them. It's a lot of effort. So if, if there's a new feature, you ask yourself the question, mm -hmm. how would a user want to use that feature? And then you go on the journey and figure out we, what yeah. you're that, we right? don't start from the feature. In fact, if there is a new feature, we ask ourselves, so when would you use it? Why would you use it? Mm -hmm. And try to figure out in which contexts and where it belongs in the documentation, then figure out. It usually spawns multiple user stories, something that may be used in different contexts. We don't limit ourselves to this is this feature, and this we need to develop documentation for this feature. We try to find where it belongs. So what if you actually have um, a more feature-oriented mind due to the fact that our project works, but what if you implement something new and with this user uh, story approach? Uh, Can we talk to you yeah. offline? Yeah. We yeah, have sure. to talk about it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we are out of time, so it, it's there is never right amount of documentation. <laughs> <laughs> Always something is missing or too much. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, guys.